In June 1969, 20-year-old Norma McCorvey discovered she was pregnant with their third child. She returned to Dallas, Texas and tried but failed to get a legal and an illegal abortion. In 1970, her attorneys, Linda Coffey and Sarah Weddington, filed suit in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Texas under the alias of Jane Rowe. Dallas County District Attorney Henry Wade became the defendant in the case. The case made its way through state and district courts until in 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in a 7-2 decision that a right to privacy under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment extended to a woman's decision to have an abortion. The ruling also created the trimester framework for legislation in order to, on their reasoning, balance the right to privacy against the state's interest in regulating abortions to protect both the mother's health and the potentiality of human life. Under the trimester framework, during the first trimester, the court prohibited legal restrictions on abortion. During the second trimester, states could restrict abortions, but only to protect woman's health. During the final trimester, the state could prohibit or restrict abortion, except where it was necessary to protect a woman's life. So once Roe v. Wade was decided, State and federal laws that violated the trimester framework were deemed unconstitutional. States had already begun loosening abortion laws leading up to Roe v. Wade. And so leading up to Roe v. Wade and after, we see the number of legal abortions per capita rise. Uh, this data starts in 1969 with zero, which I know is false, uh, up through 1970, where we start to see more liberalized laws, and then to 73, when Roe versus Wade passed. And as we see, the number of legal abortions per capita rises all the way into the 80s and peaks somewhere around 91 or so. And then starting in the early 90s, the number begins to decline and has continued to decline. This uh, data from Wikipedia that was collected out of the Gutmuncher Institute indicates that the rate of abortions per thousand women in 2014 is actually lower than it was after the passage of Roe versus Wade in 1973. Now, the Gutmacher Institute estimates that in 2011, 45% of U.S. pregnancies were unintended. Approximately 4 in 10 unintended pregnancies were terminated by abortion. In 2014, the total number of pregnancies that were aborted was about 19% of all reported pregnancies. Women aged 20 to 24 accounted for about 34% of abortions. Women aged 25 to 29 accounted for 27% of abortions, meaning that about 61% of abortions are had by women in their 20s. White patients accounted for 39% of abortions, blacks for 28, Hispanics for 25, and other ethnicities for about 9%. Approximately 44% of women who had an abortion were married or cohabitating at the time of conception, meaning approximately 56% were not. The CDC estimates that first trimester abortions account for about 88.5% of legal abortions, with approximately 60.5% occurring within the first two months. 1.4% of abortions are estimated to occur post 20 weeks or after the fifth month approximately. So what happened after Roe versus Wade, legislatively and at the social level? Well, a number of anti-abortion movements emerged after Roe versus Wade. There were a number of uh, different protest groups and strategies. Uh, one I'll emphasize here in the briefing 
was founded in 1987 by a man named Terry Randall, and it was called Operation Rescue. It was founded as a fundamentalist Christian anti-abortion movement. The organization officially advocated uh, legal tactics and civil disobedience. Uh, in general, the tactics were designed to embarrass women seeking abortions, to frighten them, uh, to harass them, and to harass the businesses and the providers themselves. In the 1990s, the group and its member, however, were associated with violence. Uh, the senior policy director, Cheryl Sullinger, was at one point convicted of conspiracy to bomb a California abortion clinic. Randall himself was also associated with individuals who murdered abortion clinic doctors in the 2000s, though there's no evidence that he uh, planned or participated in any way in those uh, murders. A number of groups practice sidewalk counseling in which they approach women entering clinics and try to convince them to change their mind. Another common tactic was the uh, human chain, where protesters would chain themselves to doors, entryways, would link arms, and try and form a physical barrier to prevent people from entering into a clinic. Uh, these, however, were largely restricted or mitigated by legal judgments during the 90s. Recently, large numbers of what are called crisis pregnancy centers have appeared. These tend to be nonprofit organizations that are typically run by anti-abortion Christian organizations. These organizations oftentimes take federal funding, and they've been accused of advertising themselves as healthcare organizations in order to disseminate false medical information, particularly worrisome from pro-choice uh, camps is a tendency for them to uh, provide false medical information about the supposed mental and physical health risks associated with abortion. Now, if you're interested in this particular phenomenon of crisis pregnancy centers, John Oliver recently did a short piece on this on Last Week Tonight, and I have that linked from our syllabus if you want to look at that. On the legislative side, a number of abortion restrictions have been introduced by various states. They fall into a number of different categories. Uh, there are some states that have introduced near total bans, which are probably unenforceable and unconstitutional under Roe, and a number of them are working their way through the court system now. Uh, some have imposed limitations on public financing. Some have introduced uh, measures designed to create a scarcity of abortion providers. Some require parental involvement for minors. Some target regulation on abortion providers, uh, making unusual or unnecessary requirements of the clinics or the doctors. Some have banned later term or partial birth abortions. Some require ultrasounds so that women have to have an ultrasound. They have to view the ultrasound, sometimes listen to the heartbeat. Uh, some have introduced limitations on insurance coverage. Some have introduced uh, additional physician and hospital requirements on abortion clinics. Now, abortion is usually an outpatient procedure. And these uh, laws have tended to try and make the clinics have um, relationships with hospitals, like bidding privileges for the physicians. They put a lot of very strong requirements that aren't required on, for instance, uh, plastic surgery clinics and so on. And then there's been a number of states that have implemented waiting periods and mandatory uh, counseling before a woman can obtain an abortion. If we look at the number of state abortion restrictions by the year enacted, we see that there's a big surge really starting around 2010. And in fact, if we look at the period between 2011 and 2013, we see that more abortion restrictions were enacted in the states 
uh, during that two-year period than the entire previous decade. So there's been a real surge in restrictions on abortion. 